Okay. <clears throat> Once again, welcome to uh, Breton Council Planning Committee. Hopefully you've all made yourself known to the usher in, in the entrance hall um, as to if you wish to speak on an application and have used the NHS track and trace system by checking in with the QR code on the entrance doors to the building, but obviously this is at your own discretion. In line with the national relaxation of the COVID rules, we are, we are advising everyone to follow the government guidance. This means social distancing where practical to do so and the wearing of face masks will be supported but not mandated by staff. Um, but it's there for staff and members and visitors to the building. Hand sanitizer, as you can see, has been provided. These measures taken together with the help to assure the safety of everyone using the building and help us to avoid the spread of COVID. The fire exits are located. Um, there are two on this wall here. There is the entrance where you came in, and there's also one down the end of the corridor where the, where the toilets are. Um, there's no fire alarm practice today, so if we hear the fire alarm go off, we will treat it as genuine, and we will exit the building and uh, congregate in the car park and wait to see all the firemen arrive. All the ladies smile when I say that. Good. Uh, toilets are located in the corridor, where I've just said. An audio recording of this planning meeting will be taken and copies are available on request. Either speak to the usher who can take your details or email democratic services at breckland.gov.uk. This meeting will also be live streamed on Breckland Council's social media channel. Mobile phones and other equipment may also be used to audio record, film, tweet or blog from this meeting by an individual council member or a member of the public. No part of the meeting room is exempt from public filming, etc., unless the meeting resolves to go into private session. The use of images or recordings arising from this is not under the council's control, but please only video the representation, representatives of the application you are interested in and only do so if you have that person's permission. The order of the meeting will not vary and will follow that of, the, of this agenda, unless as chairman I deem otherwise. Each speaker will be given a minimum of three minutes, or in the case of more than one objector or supporter wishing to speak three minutes for each relevant group. The time will be allocated to a spokesperson or shared between all speakers for each group. Where an applicant and their agent intend to speak, the three minutes is split between the two. Unfortunately, it's not possible to give an exact time when an application will be heard as the allotted time slots have been removed from this meeting. Speakers in attendance will be asked to make their way to the seats on my right, and after each application, the microphones, et cetera, will be sanitized. Once you have finished speaking, you will be asked to remain in your seat so that members can ask any questions they may have. As for the rules on voting, if the first vote is lost in considering an application, a new proposal will be requested. Example, a vote for approval if lost does not automatically mean refused. On a, tied, on a tied vote, I as chairman will have the casting vote if I choose to use it. It is also necessary for summary reasons for approvals or refusals to be identified in each case. I will now introduce my team for the day. On my left hand side, I have Mike Horn, who is a solicitor to the council. On my right, right hand side, Rebecca Collins, who's head of development services. Um, we also have um, uh, Simon Wood here as well, which is not on my list, but I knew he was gonna be here, but I didn't add it to my list. I do apologize, Simon. We have Julie Britton here as well from Democratic Services, our officer here for the day. And um, also um, Becky Harris, who was the young lady you saw as you entered, who as well as being a planning officer is also um, our usher for today. Okay, so we're going to start now. And we start with item one, the minutes. Um, I gather all members have read the minutes and can I take it that you approve these please? Agreed, thank you. Um, I'll get on my bit in a moment. Sorry, I can't get off my thing here for some reason. Go. Cool. Okay, um, number two, apologies and substitutes. Do we have any at all, Julie? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I have apologies from Councillor Marion Chapman-Allen and Councillor Kil Keith Gilbert. And in attendance um, is Councillor David Wickerson, who's substitute for Councillor Gilbert. Thank you, David. 
Okay, uh, item three, declarations of interest and representations received. I will take those as each item is raised. Number four, chairman's announcements. What was that? Alarm bell? That wasn't, a, that wasn't a fire alarm, was it? Thank goodness for that. No. <laughs> okay, thank you, Councillor Bowes, for waking us all up. Um, yes, so, uh, Chairman's announcements. I haven't got much to, add, to uh, say today. It's just um, uh, this horrible COVID thing is restricting us, and uh, I hope we can all um, behave ourselves and, and, uh, and get rid of it all and, and move on, and we can all hug each other, which will be lovely to do. I'm sure you're all desperate to give me a hug or not. And also my, my vice chairman has um, given me some information today, which I've made a note of, and then I've moved everything about. Would you like to just clarify what you told me earlier? Vice chairman, come on. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Microphone. You have 110 shopping days till Christmas. Well, it's 110 sleeps. But there is hot shopping day, so seven day a week shopping. So there we go. Thanks for that. And everyone can moan and groan at you instead of me. Good. Well, we'll cover that. So next we go to item five, request to defer. Do you have any requests to defer? None today, thank you, Chairman. None today. To keep your mic on. Items of urgent business, item six. None today, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we now go to item seven, is our local plan update. And it's over to you, please, Simon. Thank you, Chairman. This will be very quick. We are planning to take a report to Cabinet um, and the agenda for that should be published shortly. So that's the update, Chairman. That's worth waiting for. I'm flashing. Anyone wishing to ask or comment? No. Thank goodness for that. OK, um, item eight, um, a report on the Chairman's panel. Over to you again, please, Simon. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, I've just got a, a short PowerPoint just with the key points on, which I now need to uh, try and remember how to uh, share my screen. Oh, yes, that worked. <laughs> so thank you, Chairman. And uh, just, just to say that it is very good to be in a live committee setting again and to, to see you all. So, uh, so yeah, thank you and, uh, and welcome. So this is a report really just updating members on the, the views that we as officers have in relation to the chairman's panel um, and just some key points coming out of the report, which hopefully you, you've all had chance to, to read. Just to remind members that the chairman's panel was instigated as a result of a peer review by the planning advisory service who produced a report i think it'd probably be about three years ago now and the chairman's panel cake came out of that the aims of it were to to make the calling process more inclusive probably more transparent as well and reduce the number of applications going to planning committee one of the, the aims of national policy is to try and use planning committee to consider the most contentious, most strategic and most significant applications within a, within a district. And chairman's panel is a vehicle to try and ensure that that is the case within Breckland. It's important to note that it only advises on the decision-making process so there will be a recommendation from the panel as to whether or not the application should be determined through planning committee or through um, delegated processes by officers. And the final decision on that is made by the delegated officer from the council. Just a, a few statistics within the, the report. And from April 2020, which was when we started keeping records that we can rely on, till June 2021, there were 106 applications at panel, of which 33 were sent to committee and 73 were delegated. Of that 106, 35 of those applications were call-ins, which I think is fairly significant in that it shows that two thirds of those applications were applications that, that officers considered 
needed to be taken to panel for a view as to that decision-making process to be taken on them. In 2018, the average number of items on the committee agenda was 16. That came down to seven in 2020 and five in 2021, which I think members will agree is a significant reduction. And I think from a personal point of view, I think that makes for better decision making uh, because it allows members to, to properly consider an agenda and for an item to be properly debated without any time pressures. So coming out of the, the, the discussions that, that we've had, panel will remain as a virtual meeting for the time being. That will be under review. This allows members to view the meeting and to, to attend it if necessary without taking up a big chunk of the day. A member who's speaking at uh, panel doesn't have to come into Elizabeth House, hang around, then go back out again. They can come in when the, the, the item is being heard. Members who call an application to panel can address it. Where an application is heard by panel but hasn't been called in, officers have taken the view for whatever reason that it needs to go. A member can speak in relation to applications in their own or an adjoining ward. And that's been something that's been developed over the, the, the last year or so. And I think is one of the benefits of having it as a, as a virtual meeting. It's considered in conclusion that panels worked well. It allows members to engage with the process. It has significantly reduced the, the number of applications at committee, allowing committee to focus on those most significant applications. I think in, in summary, I think our view is that it's been a success. Um, it's a transparent, democratic process that members are able to fully engage with. Um, Attached to the report is a flow chart that gives an indication of how the application process uh, is, is carried out and the, the different trigger points within that. Um, that's only indicative. No applications really are, are ever the, the same as you'll know as experienced members of this committee. Um, so, Putting a flow chart out is probably a hostage to fortune, but it gives you an indication as to the, 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 the way that we determine applications. And I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Atwell, please, and then Councillor Wickerson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as you know, I was sceptical about the Chairman's panel in the early days, but I am pleased that it is being held virtually because I think that gives everybody the opportunity to dial in and see what's happening. So I think that's a good thing and I hope the virtual panel continues. Um, I just wanted to tweak to the uh, chairman's panel. I would like to see, and I know I have previously written to the director of place on this, is members have a 28 day window where they can ask for an application to be called in and considered at the panel uh, from the date that that is validated on the Breckland portal which is fine, but then I think if an application is subsequently changed and then goes out to reconsultation, to the likes of the parish councils, et cetera, I think that members should then have that opportunity at that point for the clock to start ticking and call it in again. Uh, I have had instances, as you know, where I something like that just happened in my ward and I was told that we can't speak uh, because the 28 initial 28 days had elapsed. So I think that's just a tweak. My plea is that that's a tweak that I think is a sensible tweak. Um, obviously, it's at the discretion of the chairman, but I do think that that's something that's quite important. If you're going out to subsequent consultation on a change of the application, I think that's important. And finally, um, chairman, um, I am not on the roster for the chairman's panel. And I think the reason I'm not on the roster is you will recall back in the summer, I think, when you were sending out asking people for the roster, we had big email blips, and I don't seem to have received the email, so that's why you never received a response from me. So at any time you do want me to be on the roster, please give me a shout. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Certainly in terms of that last, last point, I know Becky's sitting at the back, I can see she's making a note. Uh, we'll make sure that you're included in the, the roster. If there's anybody else who's a member of the planning committee who isn't included in the roster for whatever reason, then if they can advise 
um, Becky Harris, then we could make sure that that, that is amended accordingly. In terms of the, the call-in process, it, it's a 23-day call-in process. And I, the, I think the conclusion was that, that, that that's a, a sufficient time for members for the parish, for, for local residents to have had a look at an application and take a view as to whether or not they, they have concerns or, or otherwise about it. I think the difficulty with, with having effectively a second bite of the cherry is that it, it becomes very difficult from an administration point of view. It become, it, it, we also say, well, well, what's a major or minor, minor change? And I think you'll see from the figures that I gave previously that two thirds of applications on chairman's panel are not applications that have been called in. They're applications that, that officers consider need to go to panel very often because that even though a calling period has been missed, it's clear that they raise local issues that need to be addressed. So I think that there are safeguards there. And I would always say to, to members, if that calling period has expired and there, there is subsequent, there are subsequent issues, please contact Becky or myself and we can discuss that application with them and, and take a view as to how we how we progress it. Uh, Councillor Wickerson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, as a member of the Chairman's panel, um, I agree that it has worked pretty well. I think we, we need to reinforce um, the point that we're not there to discuss the detail of the application, which sometimes drags out the debate. Um, but I am interested in, in 112 of the report and the last paragraph, or the last sentence, I'm sorry, which says that the decision is taken, et cetera, et cetera, uh, by the uh, Director of Place and Delivery, with having regard to the views of the panel. And I would be interested to know, as uh, part of the statistics, whether in fact how many times that the officer has actually overruled the, the decision of the, of, the, of the panel. I mean, there are three people on the panel, <clears throat> And we're not always in agreement. Sometimes it's 3-0, sometimes it's 2-1 or 1-2, whichever way around you want to discuss it. But I would be interested to know just how many times that particular view of the members has been overruled by the officer. Which sometimes is Mike, of course. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm sure... Uh, if it's deemed appropriate, we can get those figures for a later meeting. I don't think, but I can I can certainly give you as the uh, officer who is mainly making those decisions now uh, what my perception is, and I'd be very surprised if the, the substantive figures actually uh, contradict that. Um, I would say it's very, it is rare to very rare that I actually go against the primary view of uh, the members on the panel. Um, I do do so, I have done so, um, but uh, in my mind, uh, there is a very heavy bias when members have voted one way uh, for me then to actually uh, decide uh, against that decision. Um, I, I would be surprised if it's more than 10% of times. Just coming very quickly, I think, I knew it'd be, there'd be one statistic I didn't have that we needed, but, but there we go. Um, I understand it's about four times since, yeah, so it, it is very, very small. Thank you. Uh, just to add to that, I, th I think the situation comes at um, the three members discuss the uh, application and, uh, and we take the vote. And then when it's um, actually decided the other way, uh, by the likes of uh, Mr. Horn, it's usually a case that he decides that there's something a bit more in depth that we're probably not touching on. So, uh, and then just to come back on part of what you said about discussing the merits and this, that, and the other, sometimes we do go a bit deep, sometimes a bit too deep, which we shouldn't do. But at times I always feel there are circumstances where we just need to scrape a little bit off the surface to have a look. And, uh, and sometimes, like I say, we, we probably go too far, but we are there and always pulled back by Mr. Horn. Um, got Councillor Clark, then Councillor Diagon. 
Thank you, uh, Simon, for your report. That's uh, very helpful. Um, it's just a minor point uh, statistically, and it won't uh, be statistically significant that in terms of the outcomes of the chairman's panel, where we have um, items where obviously members decide that's best delegated officers, when we do a roundup at the end of the year wash up in terms of where we've had appeals, uh, it may or may not be likely that we have appeals against the decision of the council um, where matters may be contentious, but we can also get appeals against delegated things. And it may be that when we do a wash end of the year, we have a distinction. So we must see whether there's a particular pattern emerging or not. It's very unlikely, I think, going on past evidence, but that's just a point to note, I suggest. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it is useful and, and it's something that, 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 that we'll look at in terms of bringing forward appeal statistics that, that show where the decisions are made, where appeals are made. But as a general statement, touch wood again, probably another hostage to fortune, but uh, at the moment our appeal record is very, is very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dorgan, please. In your sort of overall um, explaining how we got to where we are, you said that um, planning applications of strategic significance. Do we have the sort of the criteria of what constitutes um, strategic um, significance? Because um, that is rather what I might term a bit, bit on the subjective side and just, just guidance, just in case I, I might think something is strategic um, significance, which you don't, but I don't have any criteria to base what, you know, how you'd make your decision. Just. Now I've gone green. Um, no, I, I think it's it's an interesting point because once you get a definition, then, then you, it removes the flexibility really and I think what we do is we look at each application on its its merits and, and take a view significance could come in many forms it could be a big application that nobody gives a monkeys about or it could be a relatively small application that's causing uproar for for perfectly valid reasons so I think that that lack of a definition actually helps us it was, it was just a, um, if we did have a you know almost what you just said explaining it just so that we do know sort of where you're coming from i think we don't need a sort of a fixed definition it's almost giving that flexible um reasons for, which might help members you know when we're not wanting to let's, let's say call it in because um, um strategic thing isn't, isn't actually a planning issue as such can i say that um if ever i err uh, in a direction it would be uh that it should come to committee um, and, and that's my abiding principle, uh, that, that, that that is um, probably where I start um, and then I take it from there. So, it, so if, there is, if there is any reason why, um, including significance, including um, make, you, local issues, contentious, uh, I, I'm going to start from the position that it should be heard at committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, th I think it's just, um, uh, first of all, my viewpoint was, was, was as soon as we started, uh, there were some very, as, as Councillor Atwell put, skeptical people. Uh, there were a handful um, who uh, disagreed with the whole thing, but literally all of those members that disagreed when attending to see their various applications um, contacted me and said, I was really surprised how well it worked it was extremely transparent and uh, and it was the best way forward so it's it's one of those things that um it's the sort of boogeyman in the cupboard that we'd prefer not to go in and, and have a look at but when you look at the old system the old system was literally a case of myself deciding what went where and uh, paz decided that that was a lot of responsibility for one person and um it was it was open to um to misconceptions at times. And so this was the best way forward. Originally, we were advised to have five members, which I thought was difficult to maintain. But as long as it's an odd count, which we decided on three, then we knew we'd get a decision as to where we wanted that to go. Councillor Atwell coming back. I agree with all that you say, Chairman. Um, but I think the key is the transparency and the way to do that is to maintain the virtual meetings. As long as it's a virtual meeting, I'm very happy with the process. If it's something where there's four people in a room at Elizabeth House that people can't access, then I've got a problem with it. But subsequently, we've done the virtual. I think COVID forced us that way. 
So there's probably a bit more luck than judgment. But as long as it's the virtual meeting, I'm very happy with it. Okay, we enjoyed the ones in the room because we could talk about you know, no one there. So that's a shame. Never mind. Okay, um, so uh, we're going to move on to item nine now, which is planning enforcement. Again, over to you, Mr. Wood. Okay. You can tell I've not been for a while, can't you? So enforcement action is discretionary, um, but we do have statutory duty to investigate alleged breaches of planning control. There is a wealth of government advice out there on how to deal with planning enforcement and how to address issues around enforcement. And if anybody wants to have a look at the national policy guidance, um, then that will give them a clear indication as to how local authorities should address breaches of planning control. We're advised to be pragmatic and proportionate in how we investigate breaches of, of planning control. Um, I think it's very fair to say that what is important to one individual or group of individuals may not be quite so important to others. And enforcement officers have to make sure that they keep matters in perspective and deal with them in an appropriate manner. Negotiations, the best tool in the enforcement officer's armor. Um, and again, we are advised to work with applicants, agents, landowners, developers to seek a negotiated resolution to breaches of planning control. There will be occasions where the harm is so significant and it can't be resolved by a retrospective planning application or actions carried out by the, the landowner or the developer. If it's expedient to do so, and that is the, the legal test expediency, then officers should not be afraid to use the powers open to them. In terms of the enforcement team within Breckland, it was increased in 2013. We appointed the existing manager and a technical support officer, and we're currently fully staffed. Um, you'll also know that since that time, we have created a lot of processes, including the online enforcement complaint form. And I know it sounds a bit like a broken record, but it is important that uh, complaints are received via the online complaint form on the basis that, as the next point makes, enforcement is very much a legal process. We have to be seen to follow due process. We have to be seen to be appropriate in what we do. Formal action may well end up at appeal or in the courts. Lack of action may well end up with complaints to the council and appropriate um, complaints via the, the local government ombudsman. So there has to be a clear audit trail and a clear reference to the appropriate legislation and the appropriate tests. It's a very busy service. Um, that's set out at page uh, 21. We receive a significant number of cases and we have to look at them all. We can't just immediately say, well, it, it doesn't look to us that that's very serious. We have to address all and decide which is the best way to, to determine and, and action a breach of, of planning control. You'll see from paragraph 3.4 of the report, and I'll just, uh, I'll just turn it up. This shows the, the outcome of cases in the first five months of, of this year. And it can be seen that a significant number are closed with no breach of control. So a, a large number of the complaints that we get 
are not actually matters that breach planning control. Of the 180 cases closed up to May this year, 125 of them either had no breach of control, were permitted development, or were referred to another service area better placed to address the issues raised. And I think that's probably an appropriate time as well to say that the enforcement planning team doesn't act within a silo. Uh, it works with its colleagues in, in housing enforcement and in environmental health to make sure that we have a corporate approach to enforcement and that we are using the tools available to us in the, in, in the best way. There may well be cases where it is more appropriate for planning enforcement to act or for environmental health to use their powers. And it's up to, to us as officers working with our legal advisors to decide which is the best route to go down. There are also elements that we can't investigate. There are, for example, with large agricultural uses, we've had issues around noise and odour from large pig um, units, large chicken units, etc. Those are matters that are dealt with by the Environment Agency through their licensing process. Issues around highways are better dealt with by the County Council. Um, and we, we will work with both those, those bodies, but we can't effectively do their job for them. Equally, they will work with us as well. So there you have it. Enforcement is some enforcement action is discretionary we have to investigate and we have a very busy service that seeks to resolve matters primarily through negotiation thank you chairman thank you very much any questions at all before i take you councillor clark could i just say i don't want to hear anything about the any particular application that this would have referred to just the process please councillor clark Thank you very much for your uh, report. Looking at the figures here and the outcomes, and you've got 125 where um, there were no further action, um, it might or might not be helpful to illustrate more, you know, the workload, which is quite intense of the team, where you might, for example, within that 125, you might have one, not just one, but several alleged breaches around the same, you know, particular particular component you've illustrated some of those so you may get multiple uh, alleged um, instances or complaints so it might be that 125 is actually as with complaints we get about services outside planning but in terms of planning control it might be that you're showing actually there's a disproportionate amount of that 125 uh, you know that activity around particular issues or conurbation so that just that just a thought going forward Simon thank you no, I, I think that's uh, an interesting point. And, and, and yeah, there, there are some addresses where we, we get multiple complaints and they're, they're, they're very challenging in terms of how we, how we deal with them. Um, and uh, I, I think inevitably, um, everybody's home is very important to them. And it, it is inevitable that there are times when planning enforcement, along with other enforcement arms within the council, we're not alone in that, gets dragged into to issues between properties between neighbours and think and becomes part of a, a wider agenda for, for, for a lot of people and, and it's trying to step outside of that that is a challenge but it's an interesting point councillor. Thank you. Are the members okay? I think it's worth mentioning that in the past we um, every now and again we'd have an update from the enforcement team in person but um, I think there's been considerable changes in the enforcement team now and they're, they are very very busy and very much out there doing the job. And I'd rather them be doing that than, than, than wasting a morning and telling us how, how wonderful they are and uh, et cetera. So I'm quite glad that they're, they're out there doing the job. Simon? Yeah, ju just to say that we, we are having discussions about maybe bringing a, a, a quarterly or a, every four months report to, to, to planning committee just to really update and give members a chance just to, to, to discuss the service. Um, and I think it is important, Chairman, that, that we do um, sort so, of so trumpet our, our successes and, and make members aware that actually there is a lot going on underneath the, the surface in relation to, to enforcement across the whole of the, the council. 
okay? Is that just a report or you're literally talking about getting an enforcement officer in the, in the room? I think it depends. It depends very much on the circumstances, I think. Okay. Essentially, it'll probably be a report that will be presented by myself. Thank you. I'd prefer them being out there, kicking the tiles. Okay, um, thanks for that. So um, we're going to move on to item 10. The deferred applications are not... Please don't interrupt me moving. Uh, Swanton Mall is our first one, 3PL 2021-0051F. Now, before I call the people up, can I just ask that if you put your masks on, Peter will lead you in and around because we have a model of the um, application. So I want you to just all have a quick shifty around and, and then back to your seats if possible. And while you're doing that, I will call the various people who wish to speak. Starting from the bottom of my list up, I've got Wolf Maynell, who's the agent, and Richard Kenyon, who's the applicant. If you'd like to come over on the right-hand side, please. I've also got Jill Matthew, who's an objector, Kelly Pickard, who's of the parish council, and I've got Councillor Richard Duffield, who's the ward rep, and Councillor Roger Atwell, who's also the ward rep, who will be crossing the floor. Please. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I will be crossing the floor as the ward member. Um, I'd just also like to make sure there was an email that was received by all planning committee members last week from a Mrs Stone, who's a resident of Frogs Hall Lane, and I subsequently emailed councillors with uh, basically give context to her complaints about the flooding, and I did send video footage to members, which I hope they all got. Thank you very much, Councillor. Yes, very informative that was. Thank you. I've moved the facts. Um, any of the people speaking, did you wish to have a quick look at the model or are you happy with the... Uh... With the, with the model, you're happy? You're okay, okay, good. Um, okay, then we'll hand on to uh, Rebecca, please, to uh, do the presentation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, so we're application 10A um, at Swan to Morley, Morley, land on the edge of Woodgate adjacent to Frogs Hall Lane. The proposal is for our whole life zero carbon dwelling, of which there is a model in the centre of the room with detached garage set within um, landscaping. So um, just for context, here is the um, wider site context. You can see um, the main bulk of development at Swan to Morley. Um, just to the left hand side of your screen off uh, Woodgate Road and Greengate and then the application site is actually marked with a, a, a yellow circle just to the right hand side of your screen um, on a large area Greenfield site um, surrounded by hedgerow um, just off Frogs Hall Lane which you can just see to the north of the application site. Here is the red line uh, location boundary for the application site. Members will note we've had the application for a little while. Um, we've been talking to the ap applicants about the ap application and the application has been amended. So the red line has been amended. Um, the red line is now, as you see on the screen, at the frontage of the site and the location of the dwelling has been moved further north to the frontage of the site. So it's more in line with the adjacent residential development. You can also see the wider scale of the site, including the blue line, um, which will house a lot of the landscaping and ecology improvements um, that we're going to talk about in a moment. So members will note from the officer report and from the previous committee that this application was actually deferred from planning committee, the previous planning committee on the 2nd of August. Um, where it was prepared with a recommendation for approval. That withdrawal was on the basis of a letter we received from Leaves prior solicitors on behalf of Swanton Morley Parish Council. Um, you'll note from the officer's report that we've considered in detail the contents of that letter, and that is clearly set out in the deferred item section 
um, of the committee report. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that now. So the Leaves prior letter on behalf of the Parish Council um, set out a number of concerns which were uh, detailed in the officer report um, and in their letter, which is available to be on the website. So in short, they um, raised concerns about the location of development and this being an unsustainable location. They were concerned about the impact on the development on highway safety. They were concerned about the impact of the design of the development and the impact on the character of the area. They were concerned that part of the proposals are to use this development as an educational facility uh, where visitors can come and observe and learn more about the development. Um, and they were concerned that that would constitute a material change of use of this site. And also they made reference to the negligible impact, likely impact in terms of ecology and landscaping. As I say, these matters are set out in the officer report and also we had a letter from the applicant solicitor setting out their response in relation to those and that's set out in the report. But we've looked at those matters, individual matters, um, uh, as set out in the report. So going through those, um, with regards to the principle of development, members will note from the officer report that there was a previous application on this site for five dwellings. It was refused and appealed um, and the inspector um, dismissed the appeal. Um, the, the difference between that application and this site is obviously that was for five dwellings. Um, you'll note from the officer report that we comment that that's a significantly different scale from this singular dwelling and those five dwellings did not have the associated benefits of the landscape and ecology that we're going to talk about in a bit more detail. Therefore, we don't think that that decision um, is um, comparable to what members are considering here and therefore um, affects the recommendation. So um, as set out in the officer report, um, we completely agree that this is not a sustainable location in accordance with our own planning policies as set out in the development plan. That's particular regard for policy house three with Swanton Morley being a service centre village. Um, the um, policy house three, just for members benefit, I'm sure you're aware is requires that um, development out allows for development outside settlement boundaries, um, whereby the target for housing has not been exceeded the target for housing in Swanton Morley has been met in accordance with house three and on that basis you don't normally move on to the second criteria, but also the site isn't immediately adjacent to the settlement boundary. So the officer's report is quite clear that there's non compliance with policy how five uh, how oh three apologies which is an in principle policy. Um, and also in addition to that, um, Swanton Morley has an adopted neighborhood plan and uh, which sets about development and appropriate locations for sustainable development. And this application site is also contrary to policy one of the Swanton Morley neighborhood plan. What you'll note from the planning officer's report that we consider that this um, application is a matter of planning judgment. We've considered the development plan as a whole, which is required um, by planning law and we have considered the development and the other material considerations which are required by section 38.6 and paragraph 2 of the MPPF and we consider as officers that the, um, the principal objection of this being an unsustainable location has been outweighed by the positives of the development and those positives of the development in summary we consider to be that it's a, a zero carbon proposal that's um, likely to be a small scale development that contributes to reduction in greenhouse gases the design of the proposal um, the materials that are proposed to use on the proposal and that the proposal has um, ecology benefits that are over and above that we would normally achieve on a standard site for one dwelling um, and the significant landscaping proposals that the application uh, that the applicant is proposing for the wider character of the site and these matters have been secured by would be secured by condition in the event that the application was um, approved at the committee today with regards to the location of the development therefore it is a countryside location it is in the open countryside it's not immediately adjacent to the settlement boundary the site as i've previously indicated and shown on the aerial imaging is a greenfield site and as I previously set out, Swanton Morley have met their housing targets, so the proposal is contrary to policy house three of the local plan. However, we think that the house um, is a sensitive design, we think it's, it's a, a good architectural design, it uses natural materials, and as I've mentioned, there is significant landscaping and ecology benefits proposed with the wider landscaping of the site that we've taken into consideration in the determination of this application. 
as I previously set out, the red line boundary has changed. Um, previously, the um, dwelling was proposed much further south in the application site. We felt that that had the potential to impact the wider landscape character, the intrinsic beauty and character of the open countryside, setting it way back into the site. And therefore, in discussions with the application, we've had the um, dwelling move much further north on the site. As you can see, it relatively lines up with the dwellings or the development that's to the north, but definitely in line um, with the extent of the development, so up to their rear boundaries. Um, obviously, as we set out, there are net zero gains um, to be had with the development, so there needs to be space around the development site to be able to benefit from those things. So we've taken those into consideration and we now consider that the location is much more appropriate for the development. As I've set out, we've considered the intrinsic beauty and character of the countryside as required by policy EMV05 and policy Gen05. And we consider that due to that relocation closer to dwellings, that the landscape impact has been modified by the new location. As set out in the officer report, the application was originally promoted as a paragraph 79E. We all know now that, that um, the MPPF as per 2021 has been updated and it's now paragraph 80E. However, that largely the sentiments remain the same. Um, that said, the application was assessed as a paragraph now 80E. Um, and it was considered not to comply with paragraph 80E in the officer's opinion in that regard. And that's because we don't consider this to be an isolated location. Um, that's having regard to the Brams Hill judgment, which is the most up to date um, judgment in that regard. And that's set out in your officer report. Um, and in addition to not being isolated, which is the first principle of paragraph 80 before you move on to part E of that, um, we didn't consider that the, this particular development met the extremely high test of Part E of Paragraph 80. And on that basis, we haven't considered it as a Paragraph 80E application. We've considered it as a single dwelling on its own merits. With regards to the impact on the Highways Authority, members will note from the officer report that the Highways Authority have been consulted in this regard. Um, the Highways Authority did raise concerns that they um, that the residents of this dwelling would need to access primarily services and facilities by car, and therefore they would be reliant on that basis. Us as officers aren't arguing on that basis, but given taking into account the Bramshill judgment in not being an isolated site, we're not saying it's so far detached from Swanton Morley that it couldn't access the services and facilities within. Um, um, the Highways Authority are clear in their response that um, they could not substantiate an objection in highway safety terms to development in this location. And also we've had due regard to paragraph 111 of the MPPF, which requires us to refuse planning permission in the event that the highway's impact will be considered to be severe. Well, the development and the number of car movements from a dwelling of this size and scale would not result in a severe highways impact in our view and therefore um, we do not consider that it doesn't accord with paragraph 111 of the MPPF. You'll note from the officer's report that um, for the reasons I've set out that it, it, it's not sustainable development as in immediately adjacent to Swanton Morley um, that there is part we're saying part compliance with policies TR01 and TR02 of the local plan they're your highways policies so we don't believe that this is promoting walking and cycling because of the distance from the settlement boundary however the second part of those policies about the impact on highway safety and again I would reiterate that the highways authority haven't objected on that basis in terms of the benefits of this proposal um, we think it's an acceptable design we think it, we accept that it is different from the neighbouring properties in this location and, and perhaps the wider character of the area. However, it is moving outside of those parameters um, to reach, you know, gains in terms of gas emissions and zero carbon. Um, and we've assessed the development in terms of the intrinsic beauty and the character of the countryside and given the, the design of it, the relatively low scale of it, the surrounding landscaping, we don't believe it to have an impact in that regard. Um, and the further elements of, of appreciation with regards to the design policies are set out in paragraph 2.4 of your report. Section 12 of the MPPF um, seeks to encourage innovative innovation, <laughs> easy for me to say, and change. Um, and I think it's really important that, you know, um, we don't have to have a pastiche development of what is there before. The MPPF is clear that we should be supporting change where change is appropriate to the character of the wider area. Um, and that's all, all, 
also set out in paragraph 134 of the MPPF. Us as officers therefore have noted that it's not the same as the wider character of the area, but it is a change that is acceptable in our, in our opinion. Paragraph 158 of the MPPS also recognises the, um, the, the, the benefit that small scale development can contribute to cutting greenhouse gases, so we've taken that into consideration in our determination. Um, officers consider that this is good architectural design, that it adds to the quality of the overall area, that it uses effective landscaping and is small scale, which will um, contribute to the greenhouse gas emissions, to cutting greenhouse gas emissions, apologies. And take, looking at our policies overall, us as officers consider there's overall compliance with policy Gen A2, How 6 and parts of COMO 1 when they refer to design and the wider character of the area. I touched on um, part of the application, applicant's proposal to use this as an educational facility, so they, they would like to invite um, local, local groups and interested parties to benefit from the things that they're trying to achieve on this site with regards to zero carbon and how they achieve that and the matters, the wider ecology enhancements. Um, you'll note from the officer report that um, we've sought to require that at condition 10. Um, the leaves prior letter did raise a concern that condition 10 wasn't enforceable. We've had a legal opinion in that regard and it is an enforceable condition. You'll also note from the officer report uh, the number of visits that is proposed and they're very, very minimal. And in that case, that would be a secondary use to the main use of the residential development and there wouldn't be a material change of use. So there is no necessity to include those educational visits as part of the description of development. And they can be adequately conditioned um, as I've previously set out. And just to mention while I'm, I'm mentioning legalities, there is a section 106 agreement that has been drafted and agreed with the applicants. Um, ready to go in the event that planning permission was granted today. Obviously, um, in the drafting of that, that has been checked by our legal team and is enforceable and meets the tasks required for a, section, for a legal agreement. With regards to ecology, um, Leaves Pryor said that felt that there was a negligible impact um, on ecology from the, the proposed development. However, you will note from the officer report that our ecologist has assessed the scheme and say on a number of occasions that the, the proposed ecology benefits are over and above what one would usually expect for a residential development of this size and scale or an individual residential development. And therefore, on that basis, we, we do feel that the, the ecological ecology apologies will be enhanced in this location and is a material consideration which can be taken into consideration in the determination of the application. I've set out that there will be a section 106 agreement. This is um, required to secure payments in the event the owner cannot achieve the whole life zero carbon emissions that they intend to achieve. And like I say, that section 106 agreement is drafted and agreed in principle. With regards to the interest in the application, um, Swanton and Morley Parish Council have written in objecting to the application. Um, there are no statutory objections um, to the application from our statutory consultees, um, but members will note from the officer report that the CPRE did object to the application on the grounds it doesn't meet. It says in the report paragraph 79E, obviously that's now paragraph E. We have had 17 letters written into the application, of which 14 are objections and three letters of support. Their comments are detailed in the officer report for members. We have assessed the application, given its location on the site, its distance from neighbouring properties, the intervening landscaping that exists and is opposed, and we don't consider there would be an impact on the amenity of neighbouring property, properties. So I'll just um, show, run through the presentation for you. So um, the application site and the blue line. Um, this slide is to show you the relationship um, of the site to the Swanton Morley settlement boundary, which is to the west of the application site and shown in pink for you on the side in front of you. You can see that it's clearly distance from the settlement boundary. Although there is development intervening and on that basis, that's why we don't consider the site to be isolated within the context of paragraph 80. This is the um, obviously elevations and um, you've seen a model of, uh, of the proposal within the site in, in front of you. Um, the materials I've mentioned, um, we've, give, we've given consideration to um, the cedar red shakes and the sections of green roof and the um, natural cork cladding. And this is a bit more detail of those individual materials and how the site is being constructed. 
further elevations of the site. You can see the majority of development is single storey and therefore um, is unlikely to have a significant impact either on neighbours or the character of the street scene. And the southern elevation. Finally, the west elevation, you can see in this west elevation, the green roof just to the right hand side, side of your um, screen, that would be a wildflower green roof. And I know the writing on this is very small, so don't try and read the writing, um, but you can see um, around the site how the wider blue line site and that the applicants have thought about every section of the site, how it's going to be developed and how it's going to contribute to biodiversity and landscaping. And these are some of the um, measures that, that are actually detailed in that very small writing. Um, so the reinstatement of a former mile pit, natural woodland regeneration, new hedgerow, um, wildflower meadow, um, log piles, bat and bat fire boxes. So this is a bit, this is a, a bullet point version of some of that detail that's on the plan, but the applicants have gone into a lot of detail about what they're proposing in terms of, particularly in terms of ecological benefits, but also the landscaping that will support that. And here, um, uh, you can see a um, visual image of what the site could look like um, in the event it was to gain planning permission today. Uh, there isn't a supplementary for this application, but I do have an apology to make to members in that um, in the officer report, um, when we talk about design, we refer to policy 12 of the Swanton Morley neighbourhood plan. In fact, we were looking at the examination document of the neighbourhood plan when we referred to policy 12. And actually, we should have referred to policy 11 of the Swanton Morley neighbourhood plan, which is the final adopted document. I have looked at the two, two, poli the two policies together, um, and it doesn't change our recommendation in that regard, although they are subtly different in their wording, the sentiment remains the same. And therefore, um, subject to that apology of, of quoting the wrong policy, we have considered the content of that policy appropriately. Um, so therefore, just to conclude, um, we have, it, members must, apologies, must um, have regard to section 38.6 of the um, Town and Country Planning Act, which is also repeated in paragraph two of the MPPF, which requires you as members to determine applications in accordance with the development plan taking into consider all other material considerations. And at C35 of the deferred section of the officer report, um, officers have done this planning balance for you. Um, and in reaching the recommendation on this application, we have considered the development plan of, as a whole. And whilst it is acknowledged that there is non-compliance with policies how to and how three of the Breckland local plan and policy one of the Swanton Morley neighborhood plan, as well as parts of policies Gen 02, Com 01, TR01 and TR02. The proposal is however, considered to comply with policies EMV04, EMV05, EMV06 and INF02 and relevant paragraphs of the MPPF, which are listed within the report. The proposal also partially complies with policies Gen02, COM01, TR01, TR02 and HOW6 of the Breckland Local Plan. Therefore, when considering the development plan as a whole, as we're required to do members and applying the planning balance, um, and judgment, despite the principle of development not being supported in this location with regards to policies in the development plan, matters of design, landscaping, ecology and net zero carbon are considered to comply with policies within the development plan. And it is officers' opinion that these matters are considered to outweigh any non-compliance with the development plan and there is considered to be overall compliance with the development plan and relevant parts of the MPPF as previously set out. And on, it is on this basis that the proposal has been recommended for approval, subject to the signing of a Section 106 agreement and the conditions listed in the officer report. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. Um, Councillor Atwell, would you like to go first or last? Last, please, Chairman. OK. Um, Councillor Duffield, would you like to go one before last? Thank you very much. OK, um, we've got Kelly Pickard of the Parish Council. Um, you're not chairman, obviously. I think you're chairman, aren't you, Mr. Atwell? Okay, Mr. Atwell, yes, OK. Are you vice chairman or just... You're the clerk. Well done. That's what I wanted. The, I wanted your official title. And just to let everyone know, um, you will obviously all have three minutes to speak. 
And at the end of your three minute time, just so you know you haven't overrun, you get the bell. Sorry, Councillor Wickerson, you're new to this. <laughs> okay, so you get the bell and, and when you hear that bell, can you just sort of start to sum up? That doesn't mean go on for another three quarters of an hour. That means finish on that sentence if possible. Okay, thank you. Okay, you have three minutes then uh, on behalf of the Parish Council. Thank you, good morning. The Parish Council strongly objects to this application for all the reasons it set out in its previous correspondence and they sent on behalf of, by our solicitors. Planning officers have confirmed the application does not comply with policy one of the Swanton Morley neighbourhood plan because the site is outside of the defined settlement boundary of the village. They also confirm that the application does not comply with policy HOU03 of the local plan for the same reason. Planning officers have also confirmed their view that the proposed development does not comply with paragraph 80E of the MPPF. This application therefore does not comply with any of the important locality policies when determining this application. The application does not in our view enhance the local environment. It is our view that building on this green field and the subsequent human habitation upon it cannot enhance the current environment that nature currently enjoys unhindered. The field is also located in an area identified as being of moderate to high landscape sensitivity, as defined in the Breckland Settlement Fringe Landscape Assessment. The site has been the subject of a previous outline application from the same applicant to construct five dwellings on the site which was refused and subsequently dismissed on appeal. The appeal inspector concluded that the site is in an unsustainable location. We concur with the inspecting inspector given that Broxhall Lane is an unadopted, unmade single track and that three roads leading on to Woodgate are single lane with no footpath path provision anywhere. The appeal inspector makes reference to what was at the time the emerging neighbourhood plan in paragraphs 29, 30 and 31 of his report. At paragraph 31, he stated, I therefore conclude that the proposal would have limited benefit in meeting either the housing requirements of Swanton Morley Parish in particular, or those of Breckland in general. We contend that if five proposed dwellings would have been limited benefit, then this proposed one dwelling must surely have negligible benefit. In his conclusion, the appeal inspector stated that this is a proposal which would not be in location which is or could be made sustainable. He went on to say there would be inherent harm from developing a greenfield site. Our neighbourhood plan was subsequently completed and adopted in 2019. Policy 11 of the plan states new development, including infield development and residential extensions, should respect and where possible enhance the character of the village of Swanton Morley and be in accordance with all of the following criteria. In particular, item three of this policy says, recognizing and reinforcing the distinct local character in relation to the height, scale, density, spacing, layout orientation, features and materials of the building. The existing dwellings in this location are predominantly of traditional Norfolk red brick and pan tiles. The proposed dwelling, which is surrounded on three sides by existing dwellings, is in no way in keep with the area, and planning officers have acknowledged this fact. For all of the aforementioned reasons, we ask that you refuse this application. Thank you for your time. Someone obviously spent the evening in front of the bathroom mirror with a stopwatch. Well done. Okay, um, we've now got um, Jill Matthew, please, who's an objector. If you'd like to do your three minute presentation, yes. please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. And thank you for letting me speak on behalf of the people who actually live in Woodgate beside this development. There's a principle in medicine called first do no harm. And that's when you're about to do something to a patient that's a bit dodgy. And you actually think, well, actually the benefits are not that great but the harm is going to outweigh the benefit. And in other words, don't do it. And this can be applied to planning applications because we use the word harm when we're talking about planning. And the planning officer has clearly stated in her report that any harm caused by the location of the development has been outweighed by all the other material planning considerations which you have heard. But I realise what this application is about. It's really about an unspoiled, attractive field, which is going to have harm inflicted on it by the building of this house. And the fact that people have tried to stop the harm, Swanton Morley Parish Council, some of the national and local planning policies that would be inflicted by the building of this house. And also the neighbours who have also tried 
by seriously objecting 14 occasions to the building of this house. Most of this planning application and the things you've heard, the ecology reports, the landscaping, the bird boxes, the bat boxes, the design, the educational visits, are there by necessity because it's an attempt by the applicants to mitigate the harm done by the building of this house. This field is already a zero carbon field and it still would be, assuming a house is not built on it. Do you think the damage caused by the building of this house on a greenfield site is really mitigated by red cedar shingles and people in minibuses coming to visit it? Can a pile of wood for reptiles compensate for a crushed stone driveway for two cars? Is imported oak cladding such an important leap forward in rural Norfolk that it deserves study by others? And we just don't think so. These alleged benefits to a field that has nothing on it, it's not to the residents. You have never heard a benefit or the residents mentioned. These alleged benefits do not outweigh the harm and are simply what we would call greenwashing. We thought and believed that the local and national planning regulations existed to prevent the unnecessary harm associated with this application. We thought that they would be upheld by the Brecon Planning Department as the environmental risks of this application are clear and the benefits are minimal when you consider the field is currently untouched. We are hoping that you as a committee might view things differently and apply the principle of first, do no harm. The field is a wildlife haven, a zero carbon field, and is best left alone. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got uh, Wolf Mainall now. And also we've got uh, Mr. Kenyon here, who's the applicant, but he's in here for questions. Okay, you've got three minutes in, please, sir. Good morning. Having, be, having been raised in this district, I was particularly proud when Breckland was one of the pioneer councils to declare a state of climate emergency and committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2035. Furthermore, our local and world leading university, the UEA, updated its mission, and I quote, to understand, empower, and act to enhance the lives of individuals and the prospects of communities in a rapidly changing world. These local statements, recently emboldened by the powerful IPCC report, make our global collective responsibility to future generations very clear indeed. Cork Oak House goes way beyond net zero and is committed through a legal agreement to achieving whole life zero carbon. Unlike net zero, whole life zero carbon includes all embodied carbon emissions from mining, material fabrication, transport, construction, and maintenance. Furthermore, all carbon offsetting achieved through energy generation and tree planting will be limited to the site itself. In simple terms, after 30 years, the Cork Oak House site will be a carbon sink locally, nationally, and globally. The project achieves this through, number one, the expanded cork panel facade is made from waste cork chippings from the wine industry and provides a robust, natural, and aesthetically pleasing external finish. It provides ample thermal and acoustic insulation and a natural hygroscopic vapor control layer. This three-in-one magic material has been developed through a collaboration between Studio Bark and the Sustainability Research Institute specifically for this project. Number two, the building benefits from innovative, no concrete foundations. These are low carbon, allow for biodiversity, reduce the impact of flash flooding, and are ready for our transition to the circular economy. Number three, the Bluetooth mesh enabled and data driven heating and ventilation system is powered by the latest in solar battery technology, married with a network of paper thin graphene infrared heaters, dramatically reducing operational energy demand. Number four, driven by our brilliant ecology team and supported by Professor Carl Sayer of UCL and the Norfolk Ponds Project, Cork Oak House offers a new way to enhance and conserve. This is through the resurrection of a former ghost pond, the provision of three new innovatively seeded ponds, natural woodland regeneration, seasonal solar shading, the restoration of a former orchard. To conclude, 
Our brilliantly ambitious clients, Richard and Helen, are so committed to the success of this project that through their connections with local schools, have put Cork Oak House forward for educational projects with two annual visits secured by condition. I reach out to members today to support this forward thinking house so that we can start working towards a whole life zero carbon future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've got uh, Councillor Duffield, please. Three minutes, sir. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, first of all, I'm all in favour of carbon neutral housing that. I'm afraid I'm old fashioned with regard to design. They look to me like Friar Tuck and Robin Hood would walk out of it. Um, but main points on this is the parish council spent a lot of time, money and effort into forming and doing a neighborhood plan, which was encouraged by Brackland. And why should the officers and the committee go against her? I can't justifiably say a reason. The site is on a very narrow road. I personally, if my children went to Swanton Morning School, I wouldn't be very happy about them going down there in a minibus because there is only a single track. So the educational side benefit is no way outweighed by the impact of a house in the area where the people of Swanton Morley do not want it. Um, there has been a problem down there flooding, which has not been mentioned. Um, I've seen some photos and that that was passed through to me uh, from the parish council. So I would uh, ask you to go against the officer's recommendation and support the parish council and the local people and refuse it um, because of the neighborhood plan and what they actually need in their village. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Atterwell, please. Three minutes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. It's my view that this application will provide no benefit to Swanton Morley or the wider Breckland area. It is clearly not in keeping with its surroundings and the location has previously been described by an appeal inspector as not being in a location which is or could be made sustainable. The application does not comply with any of what I term the key locality policies contained within the neighbourhood plan or local plan. It is not within or adjacent to the settlement boundary, and this is a very important consideration. It is also important to note that planning officers have also confirmed that the application does not comply with paragraph 80E of the MPPF. Planning officers have conceded that the design of this application is not in keeping with its surroundings. In particular, it does not comply with the need for a design to be sympathetic to local character and history, including the surrounding built environment, as stated in NPPF paragraph 130E. Nor does it recognise and reinforce the distinct local character in relation to features and materials of buildings, as prescribed in policy 11 of the neighbourhood plan. The applicants make much of the fact they will allow two educational visits per year to the dwelling. With so few visits and frankly so little for visitors to see, this is hardly a significant material consideration. There are already a number of free publicly accessible sites in the parish of Swanton Morley which provide much greater educational value and interest in terms of ecology and biodiversity, including SAC and Treble SI sites. There is also a back conservation project in the local church, which school children can walk safely to, thanks to previous planning footpath improvements put in place to accord with the wishes of local people. We also have a climate and environmental working group to provide even greater biodiversity within the village. This year alone, there's been over 800 new trees planted. The concept of zero carbon homes is interesting, but this is just one dwelling which will make very little difference and does not outweigh the harm caused by disregarding a number of key development plan policies. Frankly, we need all homes to be built to a zero carbon standard if we're going to make any meaningful change. And importantly, those homes need to be located in the right place in accordance with the development plan policies and not despite those policies, as is the case with this application. The Swanton Morley community spent almost five years producing its neighbourhood plan, which was the first in Breckland to provide an additional land allocation over and above that which was allocated in Breckland's local plan. 
This additional allocation will accommodate up to an additional 120 homes in the sustainable heart of the village near to services and amenities. Many local residents, including many from Woodgate, actively engaged in the neighbourhood plan process and helped over many months to shape its final policies. Please do not ignore their wishes for the sake of just one dwelling. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Councillor. It is open to questions from members. Do you have any questions at all for the officers or for any of our speakers who are here? Okay, I'm going to take you down the row. I'll take Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Clark, and then Councillor Crane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was very impressed by the um, agents' um, use of carbon neutral materials and things like that, and obviously not using concrete footings. Um, that's all well and good, but um, it is in the section 106 agreement that proof will only be needed if it's a carbon neutral building within 30 years of first occupation. Now, that doesn't add up to me, you know, it's the here and now we should be thinking of. So why is that such a long 30 years in uh, section 106 agreement when you've described materials that should be acting now? This is a very complex topic. Um, the carbon cost of a new building can equate to up to 50 tonnes of carbon for a standard house build, or that's 50 tonnes of CO2, which is, if you would imagine lifting that up, would be a very heavy amount of CO2. Um, this embodied carbon is not calculated in our net zero targets. So what we're trying to do here is, is something quite different, whole life zero carbon, which is about calculating all of the CO2 cost up to the date of first occupation, and then mitigating those costs through low carbon materials, carbon sequestering materials, energy generation, and uh, by planting trees, hedgerows, and grasslands to actually uh, suck up some of that carbon. Um, so there is no such thing as a building that exists on day one and is zero carbon. And this is a, a very common misconception in the, the wider kind of net zero movement. Um, the, the um, standard British standards uh, methodology of calculating whole life carbon actually sets that target at 60 years. That's what you would normally calculate. So we're trying to do something which is ultimately twice as good as what would be the, I believe, the future methodology of, of, cal of calculating whole life zero carbon. Okay, thank you. Are you happy with that, Councillor Wilson? Yes. Okay, Councillor Clark, please. Thank you, Chairman. I kick off with a question to Councillor Attlewell, and then I've got a question for the officer. Um, be helpful, um, Councillor Attlewell, if you could uh, talk about the neighbourhood plan in terms of the number of houses, you know, and your target, your target being met, and how long that's going to achieve. Just think of the overall position. Thank you. Yeah, so um, basically Swanton Morley's already met the target set in the local plan. So the, there's currently Hopkins Homes are building 85 new homes in the village as we speak. We've got an excellent relationship with Hopkins Homes. And they have, uh, my understanding from the landowner is that initial discussions have taken place between Hopkins and the landowners uh, with regard to the two additional fields that we put forward in the neighbourhood plan. Those fields are immediately adjacent to the school um, and there's all sorts of benefits that will come with having that development. We put an awful lot of time and effort into thinking about that. Um, and it was the previous planning policy officer, Breton Phil Spencer, who, uh, Phil, yeah, I think, Phil Milam, sorry. Uh, it was him who did all the assessments on that for sustainability. Um, and that was him who decided at the time that yes, those fields could in fact take up to 120 additional dwellings. And we're quite happy with that because there's things that we want to see in our village and we want our village to grow, but we want our village to grow in a way that we want. And that was why we did the neighbourhood plan because we gauged everybody in the village to do that. Um, I don't, you know, that, that's the reason, for, the whole reason for doing the plan was to get local people involved and come forward and they did in their droves get involved in this over many months and years actually to make it happen. So that's the situation, Councillor Clark. 
thank you. Your question to yeah, an officer. One more question, just for uh, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, I've read all the, uh, the the correspondence and looked at the the planning portal. Um, looking at the original objection that we had from highways, um, I know obviously there's correspondence backwards and forwards to us several times between us and highways. Um, and the original highways objection was there's, there's, there's two things. One is around the the, the five houses, the original five planned, but also in relation to the extra stuff around the village. But look, reading the whole of the highways objection, it seems to me they haven't actually withdrawn criticism per se, but they've just, they, they still talk about people having to walk up and down and, and tra traffic and uh, there's a reduced effect or um, harm potentially to people visiting the area and going in and out. It's not as much, but they haven't withdrawn that completely. What they've said is it's not sustained in terms of the five as a whole objective. Am I right with that? Yeah, absolutely. If you don't mind, I'll um, put that in context. So um, on the previous application um, that, like I say, was refused, appealed and dismissed at appeal was for five dwellings. The Highways Authority looked in detail at the narrowness of the lane, which Councillor Duffield has indicated. And they did think that the number of traffic movements from five dwellings could have an impact on highway safety and they objected outright on those regards. The inspector had due regard to that in his appeal and he dismissed that appeal. Subsequently, we obviously have got a reduction um, from five to one. So the number of vehicle movements has significantly reduced from five dwellings to one. And the Highways Authority do not believe they can substantiate a highway objection on the grounds of highway safety. Now, as you'll note from the officer report, there are many subsections to policies TRO1 and TRO2 of the local plan, of which obviously highway safety is one. But overall, there is a goal to increase walking and cycling and reduce reliance on the, on the private car. Um, and I think it's quite clear in the report and in my presentation that the Highways Authority have highlighted in their comments that this development would have an over, they consider this development would have an over-reliance on the private car and given the narrowness of the road, the lack of the footway, the lack of street lighting, that a, a location here doesn't encourage walking and cycling. So the officer report is clear that it's only compliant with parts of TRO1 and TRO2 and those are the two, two there are other parts but the two fundamental parts with regards to this application. Um, as always, members, it's a planning balance and it's up to you to make a planning judgment on whether you consider there's overall compliance with the development plan as a whole, so not just those policies, that's including the neighbourhood plan, um, the local plan and your other material considerations. Obviously, as officers, we recommended that despite the non-compliance with those policies, there are other material considerations and it is on that basis we have made our recommendation. It's now up to you as members to, to apply the planning balance and make a recommendation. Okay, um, thank you. I've got Councillor Crane, please. Thank you, Chairman. I think my first question has possibly... Sorry, can you put your microphone on, please? It is on. Is it? Oh, I can hardly hear you. Shall I put it closer? Um, I think my first question has possibly been answered to do with um, the zero carbon whole life. Um, does that mean from when the first spade goes in um, that that will be negated by the whole 30 years. You're not saying it will, you're not, what I'm saying is anyone who comes to work on that site, are you going to be using zero um, carbon contractors and materials from zero carbon companies? I do have another question after that. Again, this is a very complex topic. And I think I'll, I'll answer, answer that by saying, if you were to install a, a large solar PV array, um, it would obviously have a fantastic impact on energy generation over its lifespan. But on day one, the greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from creating those panels are very significant and not always spent in the UK. So we're very good at kind of ignoring those emissions. Um, but actually sometimes, for example, with solar panels, if you don't use them beyond the, say 10 years, you might find that those solar panels actually never pay back the greenhouse em emissions that they create, as one example. So that this is why whole life zero carbon as a concept exists. And this is why the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors have created it. And they've created a British standard to support that. Very, very few applications assess under whole life zero carbon. 
they assess under net zero. Um, and that basically means they can ignore all of the carbon cost of that building from day one. This is, this is a co no concrete building. So we are taking one of the largest greenhouse gas um, emitters and removing that through careful innovation of the foundation system. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to do is by 30 years, any costs associated with any part of that construction, even the food our contractors eat, which is a carbon cost, uh, at, th at 30 years, we would have proven that it will be zero. And at that point, the rest of the site and the carbon sequestering materials and the energy generation will be a carbon sink. So we'll be pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and improving our national, local, global problem. Was that? Yes, please. To... Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, my second question um, is one probably for officers. What happens in a situation like this if planning was granted and a few years down the line, the house is passed on or sold? Um, what happens with all these conditions that have been applied to the house? How do you control it continuing to be a net zero building for the next 30 years if it's not in the ownership of the person who has um, agreed to the Section 106 agreement? Thank you. Well, m members will be aware that planning permission goes with the land and not the person that it's granted planning permission. So all planning conditions will continue to apply to the development, including the Section 106 agreement, because planning permission goes with the land. Obviously, if a new person were to take the development on, they can seek to, to vary the planning permission, and that would be a subject for us to consider as a separate planning application. But at this time, members, you're considering the application and the applicant in front of you, and those conditions would be relevant because they go with the land. Thank you, Councillor Kybird, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, red brick and pan tile um, are sub substantial energy users. So um, uh, embodied carbon in the current 100 houses at Swanton Morley would probably need 500 acres of woodland to offset it. But um, um, the government publication creating new woodland um, suggests that at 50 years, 300 tons of carbon is locked in per hectare of woodland. So I think your, um, you know, your, your aspiration to be fully carbon neutral um, is achievable. Um, I, I don't know if you've, uh, what sort of figure you've put in for your woodland gain. I haven't actually got the figures in front of me for that, for that uh, gain, but we have uh, produced a energy report as part of the design access statement, which demonstrates those numbers and how it does hit that target after 30 years. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Wickerson, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. It's a question for the officers, I think. Uh, members will have received a quite detailed email from a local resident from Frogs Lane in Swanton Morley with raising her various concerns about this development. And most, the largest paragraph is related to flooding and sewage, which is quite disconcerting. In the officer's report 7.4, and this is for my educational purposes, so I can begin to understand this a bit better. It says, and I quote, both foul and surface water would be fully assessed at the building regulation stages. Can we just understand exactly what that means? It seems as though it's going to be done later on and not now, if that's if I'm reading that correctly. Is that correct? Sorry. Yes, yeah, so there's there's a number of parts to 7.4. So in terms of the context of when you engage um section section 14 and our policy in the local plan is is the area at, at risk of flooding um and the um 7.4 clearly highlights that um the site is outside any area identified for flood risk or surface water flood risk um we need to remember that this is a very large site um, and there is significant opportunity for greenfield runoff and drainage rate across the wider site and significant distance to neighboring properties um, and also, you know, 7.4 makes reference to the significant amount of permeable surfaces. They're using permeable hard surfacing as well, um, water butts and the green roofs, which will all help with that um, drainage. Um, but the matter is, is raised that 
you know, foul and surface water are building regulations considerations, and the planning is really clear that we shouldn't repeat regulations. Um, so unless we're going to add to those surface water drainage requirements, usually with larger applications, we would do that on the form of suds. So we follow the sustainable drainage hierarchy and go through those elements. Um, this development is neither big enough or the site area big enough to meet those higher level say it's sustainable drainage considerations. And like I say, the site is big enough to mitigate its own drainage and therefore on that basis as officers we're confident that the building regs regulations would adequately cover the drainage. Um, and foul and surface water proposals and there's no need to apply further conditions members should only consider further conditions if the if the development cannot be mitigated and therefore you need a condition and, and as officers we don't consider that it needs to be mitigated on a site of this makeup and size thank you any further questions from members no okay thank you we're going to go for the vote on this item oh, ah you want to can i just clarify something else? of course you can Sorry. far away so just to apologies for members when I was rambling on and I have a habit of doing that, I just want to repeat what the conclusion on this is, is that, you know, officers have looked at the development plan as a whole, um, as we're required to do, and we consider that there is overall compliance with the development plan. So we've highlighted the parts of which policy that this is, the parts of the development plan, which are policies that this development is contrary to, but we've also highlighted the parts of the policies and whole policies which the development complies with, and therefore we consider there is overall compliance with the development plan, and we have made our recommendation on that basis. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, with that in mind, uh, for Swanton Morley, 3PL 2021-0051F, land on the edge of Woodgate along Frogs Hall Lane. Your officer's recommendation on this application is one of approval. Could I show of hands for approval, please? Three. Three. And those against? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, from the floor, please. Could I have your reasons to go against the officer's decision, uh, Councillor Wilkinson? It's, um, it seems that the, the committee feels that uh, it doesn't comply with the overall planning policies and the building will not be in keeping with the local environmental in the area. Thank you. Councillor Wilkin, uh, Wickerson. Thank you, Chair. I paid due attention to both sides of this um, argument for want of a better expression and in my opinion the benefits that have been listed and and i do accept the zero carbon situation have been uh do not overall the negatives in terms of lack of compliance with the swanton morley neighborhood plan uh there's really no point in having a neighborhood plan in a sense if it's going to be overruled uh, because it's the local people who put it together and it's been approved so I think the neighborhood plan in particular, apart from how three, uh, the neighborhood plan should take precedence here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Horn. Um, can I please uh, summarize um, what uh, the reasons are uh, and put it in legal jargon, which is simply that uh, having considered this matter, uh, members do not agree with the officer's recommendation that there is overall compliance with the development plan. Thank you. Following clarification from our solicitor, um, I would ask you again to vote on this application 3PL 2021-0051. Those in favour, please show hands. In favour of the appro approving the application. That's our three. And those against, so you're going to be approving it one, two, uh, refusing it one, two, three, four, five, six again. Okay, that is refused. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Julie, could we um, just switch off recording? We're just going to have um, 10 minutes for a break and start again at quarter to 12.